Thanks. But no uh, karaoke. <laughs> no, karaoke for me would be fatal to all of us. Um, <laughs> great presentation. Thanks so much. Um, obviously, the arms sale thing is the, you know, the, the elephant in the room. Um, while I was traipsing around the Galapagos, uh, the Chinese seemed to be sort of escalating their, uh, their rhetoric against uh, the sale, certainly at the senior academic levels. Um, uh, I think the other day we saw that you know, they're specifically threatening Boeing and, and Lockheed Martin and Raytheon. None of my clients, alas. Uh, uh, so a couple of questions from that. Uh, is this what we're hearing now beyond the norm? How do we square the circle or put the round peg in uh, that you know, we're concerned that we not do or say anything that seems to be lowering our support, uh, yet obviously making the arms sales uh, meets your criteria of very public demonstrations of support? Uh, it, is this, this year's Chinese rhetoric something really serious? Uh, how do we factor how they're likely to behave? Will it hurt their cost rates? You know, these are the kind of questions, you know, once you start pulling the sweater, uh, you don't know where the hell to stop. And uh, uh, I think we'd all benefit from your sense of, you know, yeah, these sales are coming. Uh, uh, the F-16 is really part of it. How is that likely to affect the big picture and the, and the bilateral U.S.-China picture? Thanks. The Obama administration, I think, has uh, rightfully emphasized the very uh, great importance of the U.S.-China relationship and the many issues that we need to work on if China doesn't, if, if China is not a player on uh, climate change and uh, responding to the financial crisis, um, it is really difficult uh, to make uh, serious progress. Um, of course, the, China is not the only country in the world, and so other countries need to, uh, to join in uh, as well. But I think that this message um, uh, of China's growing importance um, perhaps uh, is being interpreted in, in Beijing as providing uh, China with leverage on this specific issue, and I would argue uh, that they are probably miscalculating. Um, I think that uh, the, from what I have read in the media over the last uh, week, uh, we are hearing comments from Chinese, and most of them are scholars. They're, the tough language is primarily coming from uh, military researchers and civilian scholars, but there, of course, have also been some pointed statements opposing uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan by, uh, by Chinese officials. Uh, but some of these comments by scholars might be seen as trial balloons. Um, these are uh, messages being put out that the United States should be made to feel pain. Uh, that uh, the, uh, China has put up with the Taiwan Relations Act long enough uh, and the U.S. should be compelled uh, to withdraw it. And, and I do think that if uh, China really expects uh, that its um, importance to the U.S. is so great that it's going to, to, uh, it, to influence U.S. Uh, policy ta to Taiwan to the extent of ending arms sales, um, then I think um, that they have miscalculated. Um, the, uh, the line uh, that um, has come out of Beijing about arms sales recently is strong opposition to sophisticated arms sales, which uh, presumably means F-16 CDs. So the reaction to the uh, – this is the original 2001 package. Uh, so the reaction to that, um, uh, that notification from Beijing – uh, is is strong. I think it's perhaps stronger than my guess would be a bit stronger than the administration expected. And some senior, senior officials have uh, uh, have have uh, um, uh, condemned it. Um, and um, I think that's uh, probably reflecting several things. One is um, uh, a desire to forestall or try to preempt uh, F-16 sales. Um, uh, although Beijing can live with this package, the F-16 CDs, I think they see as, you know, as sophisticated arms sales and more problematic for them politically. Um, another factor, I think, is, and this, I'm, I'm, uh, this is conjecture, but I think there's a, uh, 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 an appreciation now in Beijing that President Obama's China trip did not play well in the U.S. press um, and that he is under considerable uh, pressure now to show some toughness, and they anticipate, um, uh, you know, that the Dalai Lama will meet with the president. Uh, there may be other trade things coming down the pike. So in that sense, as Bonnie suggested, I, trial balloon, I would say shot across the bow. Whatever your metaphor is, I think 
there's an expectation this is coming. And the last thing is, and here I'm on thin ground, but I would, I would, I would suggest that I think there's uh, a sense in Beijing, certainly among the blogosphere and the and the commentariat, uh, 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 pressing the government that um, that the situation has changed. That China is now the United States banker. That China has considerable influence now in the United States, um, and that, uh, that that Beijing ought to be using that leverage. Um, that runs smack dab against another instinct, which is um, uh, reflected in President Hu Jintao's statement, uh, was it in August, Bonnie, to the diplomatic, uh, to the visiting ambassadors in July, that uh, the U.S.-China relationship is, is the most important bilateral relationship for Beijing, and getting, keeping that stable is critical for Chinese diplomacy. So there's some, some internal tension here, I think. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think Bonnie's right. It, 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 the administration I th would be making a huge mistake to suggest that um, it is going to now uh, back down uh, on things like arms sales or other uh, or, or other issues be because of um, because of the rhetoric coming out of Beijing, and the key challenge will be to not back down at, at, while managing a stable relationship. So it, it, I'm sorry for going on so long. It, it, when I was during the campaign, I worked for McCain, and and and, and Jeff Bader and I used to comment offline that this was the first presidential election uh, uh, in some time where China was not a major uh, issue, where the two candidates weren't beating each up. If you think about uh, 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 Ford to Carter and Carter to Reagan and, and, then, and then Bill Clinton with the butchers of Be Beijing and so on and so forth and the, and the strategic uh, competitor comment of Condi Rice in 2000. This was the first presidential cycle where, Be where both sides had a fairly, I'm looking at Richard Bush, you know, fairly steady fairly bipartisan approach, um, and which gave the administration in some ways an unprecedented amount of leeway politically to start crafting its China policy in the first year. The irony may now be that in the second and third years, they're being forced into the politics of China that they were able to avoid, avoid the first year. I, I would agree with both. I, the one question that, that I don't think we covered, Chris, was how does this impact cross straight? Uh, and my guess would be not very much. Uh, it's one of the sort of unique characteristics that uh, the Chinese take their displeasure out on the seller as opposed to the buyer. Uh, and that seems to be, uh, uh, Taiwanese seem to be well aware of that uh, and therefore are much less hesitant about worrying about uh, the consequences. Uh, the attitude that I seem to hear in Taiwan was, well, this is one you Americans have to suck up for us. Uh, and they don't seem to be too worried about a Chinese response. But, uh, I'm going to try to sort of go to opposite sides of the room to cover cross straight. So, Nancy, let me ask you next. Nancy Bernkoff Tucker, Nancy Bernkoff Tucker, Georgetown University. Um, this is uh, directly to Mike. Um, U.S.-Japan relations uh, are not as good as they might be, and the discussion has been largely on issues of. Uh, American military in Japan, perhaps that the new government wants to improve relations with China a lot, and that makes us uncomfortable. How does uh, Cross Strait figure into this and the possibility of real CBMs? Is this going to worry the Japanese, scare them? Uh, what kind of reaction are they likely to have? Could, could everyone hear the question? No. Yeah. The, the, the question was, uh, to paraphrase, now that U.S.-Japan relations are a little wobbly, <laughs> I forget the word you used, but it, it, you know, difficult, um, uh, is the uh, prospect of cross-strait CBMs going to worry the, the Japanese side? It's a hard question to answer because, um, you know, in any democracy you have a variety of views, and Japan's democracy and coalition government now is particularly untidy. <laughs> And it's particularly difficult to ascribe one view uh, on this. You have Ichiro Ozawa, the Secretary General of the party, who d took a delegation of over 600 political followers to Beijing. I'm told Hu Jintao shook every person's hand uh, in the delegation, um, which uh, was, was it means something. I don't know what. That's a lot of, <laughs> it's, a lot of it's, it's a lot of Purell. <laughs> um, uh, and um, uh, in, 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 in contrast, you have people like Maihara, Seiji Maihara, or Aki Nagashima, the vice defense minister, who are, you know, pretty um, 
strong on the US-Japan alliance and pretty hard line, frankly, on China. So within the DPJ, there's, it's hard to say what the, the common view is. Operationally, the relationship between the US and Japanese bureaucracies and the US and Japanese military is excellent. Um, and my own sense is most of the DPJ also has a pretty strong commitment to the alliance, but they're, they're having difficulty sorting out how they're going to handle some specific issues. The most problematic is Futenma, this Marine Corps air station in Okinawa, and in some ways that's the biggest problem for Taiwan because if uh, this, uh, some people say, you know, it's just one air base, why are we letting the whole U.S.-Japan alliance get all tied up around this? And I think uh, in Hawaii today, Hillary Clinton is going to talk about a broader vision for the alliance so that we're not completely consumed with Futama, but it's pretty darn important because if uh, Prime Minister Hatsuyama, by putting this decision off on, on implementing Futama, causes it to fall apart, then the, the rest of the package, which involves moving Marines to Guam and realigning bases, is going to freeze because the U.S. Congress will not pay for it. The, the, the new facility in Futama that's in dispute is, is a condition for the overall move, which will mean that the U.S. presence in Okinawa will essentially freeze in its Cold War structure, which will be very frustrating for the Okinawans, for Tokyo, and for the Marines and everybody involved. And, and that starts to raise questions about how sustainable that presence is and how much support there is in Japan for the U.S. forward presence in Okinawa, which is strategically important across the region, but especially on the Taiwan Straits. So if I were in Taipei, I'd be watching this very, very nervously. Um, even if the DPJ has the right intentions, the signals it sends are, are problematic. And, you know, dissuading China, uh, the PRC, from thinking it can use force to resolve the Taiwan problem uh, is, you know, a particular mission for the U.S. because of the Taiwan Relations Act and so forth. But the U.S.-Japan alliance plays a critical role in that. And the strengthening of def the revision of defense guidelines, the strengthening of U.S.-Japan interoperability over the last decade or so, I think has been a really important factor in Chinese thinking about how it approaches the Taiwan problem and the utility of force. And so if, to the extent that's wobbly, it doesn't help. Uh, but that said, I think um, Takoko will talk to his friends in Tokyo, and <laughs> hopefully we will uh, we'll get through this. But the next few months uh, it will be uncertain. Good. I, I wouldn't be the shameless self-promoter I am if I didn't mention to you that on Friday uh, at the Willard Hotel uh, from 10 to noon there will be a public forum on Japanese domestic politics hosted by the Pacific Forum. And from 2 to 5 on Friday, again at the Willard, uh, there will be a public forum on the U.S.-Japan alliance where we have been and where we are going featuring Bill Perry and Rich Armitage and and a couple of others. It's open to the public. If you need more information on it, give me an email address, and I'm happy to send you info. Now, I saw a gentleman, uh, yes, right here. Hi, thank you. David Ahn from the State Department. Uh, question, uh, following up on Mr. Michael Green's comments on superficial uh, versus kind of substantive or effective CBMs, I'm wondering, um, the impression would be that CBMs should be mutually binding uh, so how would constraints imposed on Taiwan not also bind China? Could you kind of go more into the nuances? Or how would an, inc an increase in Taiwan's disadvantage, uh, how would that lead to an increase in Taiwan's disadvantage rather than lower tensions on both sides? I'll let you start okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. That's, that's the usual pattern. Um, uh, well, as Bonnie pointed out, see, she can't correct me if I quote her. <laughs> As Bonnie pointed out, um, this is a unique uh, dynamic because Taiwan is in a in the far more vulnerable position and has limited, if 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 not zero, capacity to uh, attack the, the mainland. It's 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 overwhelmingly a threat aimed in one direction. So any uh, binding CBM that that freezes or constrains Taiwan's ability to continue improving and making up for gaps in readiness and capability and interoperability. Uh, uh, is not threat reduction, uh, even, even if there's a, a, a degree of mutuality to it. Um, and frankly, even I, I would think that mutual uh, uh, steps uh, at threat reduction will be pretty tough because of the, there's also an imbalance in transparency. It's not to say they shouldn't be on the agenda for the longer term and address, but, but, but those are, and, and I, by the way, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of the box a bit. I'm not suggesting in any way the U.S. would, uh, uh, would in the future blanket oppose uh, these things, but it would be a concern or something that would be watched to make sure it didn't lock in um, not only the imbalance, but lock it in in a way where it continues 
uh, to um, accrue to China's military benefit. I'm correct. Well, first I should say CBMs are unlike, as you know, arms control treaties. I mean, they're not legally binding. They're sort of politically binding. Um, the upside of that is that they're sort of easier to enter into. The downside is that then they're easier to back out of. Uh, and uh, so there has to be political will on both sides uh, to do that. So um, binding is not quite a word that I would uh, apply to CBMs, at least certain, certainly not in the legal sense. Uh, but I think that the really important thing for the from the, the mainland and Taiwan to do are, are to continue to engage in what I would call a process of reciprocal unilateral CBM steps so that each side can take some measures to signal political goodwill to the other side. Now, it, it, in a preliminary stage, those steps are likely to have more political meaning uh, or sig significance or symbolism than real military uh, significance. And Mike talked earlier about a, a few missiles or hundreds of them could be pulled back but could be rolled uh, forward uh, in the event that the mainland wanted uh, to do so. Um, and that's an important point, but it would nevertheless be uh, politically uh, symbolic and a useful gesture to begin that process of, uh, of, of pulling them back. Um, eventually, the hope is that they would be uh, dismantled uh, and destroyed. And more re recently, President Ma has um, pointed out that, of course, the threat to Taiwan goes beyond the missiles. We spend a lot of time just talking about the missiles, but it's far broader than that. And he has um, now said that publicly. And so I think that steps, um, particularly since the threat is asymmetrical, that both sides need to think about what they can do uh, unilaterally to build some um, trust with the other side. And there may be, th those steps may, in many cases, be asymmetrical. Um, through negotiations, there might be different kinds of CBMs that could be um, agreed upon, but there's a lot that can be done um, in the near term uh, and even in the longer term unilaterally. This gentleman right here in the front row, and then we go to the fellow standing in the back next. John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. It's kind of interesting um, that. Uh, um, it, it, it is the uh, U.S.-Taiwan relations that uh, probably need some urgent uh, CBMs that we are, uh, we are here uh, to discuss cross-strait CBMs. Uh, but anyways, uh, it's, it's, I have a question with regards to a point uh, already discussed by Bonnie and Mike um, um, to some extent, but I'd like to explore a little bit further. Um, usually, CBMs work best um, between rivals or adversaries of equal strength. Um, what would be the uh, uh, incentive for the PRA to really agree to embark on this? Um, uh, you know, beyond superficial measures like uh, accident preventing, uh, rescue uh, missions, uh, you know, the real CBMs, what is the, uh, the incentive for the PRA to do this, particularly um, when arm sales is not going to come into play. Thank you. Well, I, th I think that's an important question, but I want to take it up to a higher level and ask what's the incentive for the mainland more broadly. I mean, the PLA itself, more narrowly minded, may see that there is little incentive in cutting back uh, the deployments uh, that they have made, uh, but the PLA doesn't make final decisions in, in, on, on the mainland. And so I think it's really important to ask more broadly, why should China engage in this process? And, and I would argue that if China has the goal of uh, improving relations with Taiwan, settling differences um, with Taiwan, and preventing uh, the Taiwan from moving in a direction toward independence that it doesn't like, that needs to take very significant steps to really win over the hearts and minds of the people. Um, I think that the shift in, in China's policy away from a policy of pushing for near-term uh, reunification and emphasizing more a process, uh, the process of peaceful development that CBMs fits in very well with that new uh, <coughs> policy as stated by Hu Jintao. 
uh, to develop a, a, a peaceful development across the Straits and to convince the people um, on Taiwan that uh, China has uh, goodwill uh, for them, not ill will. There's a hell of a lot that China needs to do in order to achieve that goal. And as long as the people, as my President Ma has said, as long as the people of Taiwan face this huge military um, uh, opposite them, how are they to be convinced? Uh, that the mainland really does have goodwill. So I think there's a lot of incentive there at the top. But for the PLA, I think it's understandable they would be more narrow-minded. narrow, narrow minded. One, of, one of the, just to, uh, I completely agree with that, and one of the, one of the things we, I think, in the U.S. discovered with the EP3 incident, with the um, more recent incidents in the South China Sea, is that crisis management is difficult with Beijing because civilian control of the military is so opaque, if not weak, uh, yes, Hu Jintao chairs the Central Military Commission, but up and down the bureaucracy, you don't have the kind of um, connections that you have in, in our governments between the civilian uh, bureaucracy and the military, and you don't have the kind of transparency. So in some ways, from my perspective, when you pursue transparency in CBMs with, um, with China, whether it's Taiwan or the U.S., part of it is testing uh, the uh, ability of, uh, of, 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 of the civilian uh, officials um, to uh, manage the PLA or the extent to which there is um, a crisis management capability or connection within, within China. It's, in some ways, uh, CBMs, uh, are, in other words, are a little bit of a test and an exploration of the nature of the other side's decision-making, transparency, uh, and, uh, and civil-military relations. Um, and if it goes well, then that reinforces confidence. If it goes badly, it makes you wonder about it. Yeah. All right, the gentleman standing in the back, and then after him, the fellow in the red shirt. Uh, Mike Fonte, I'm the DPP liaison here in Washington. Uh, thanks again for a great presentation. I just wonder, Bonnie, if you could explore a little bit for us the question of transparency by, of the Ma administration on a variety of issues has been a critique of the, of the DPP, certainly. Uh, it covers a, a range of issues, and obviously the consensus building that's necessary for serious CBMs is an issue here that you've already spoken about. So I wonder if you'd explore for us a bit of what kind of input, if any, you got in your conversations from people who are considered, quotes, green, uh, that is, lean towards the DPP side of the equation, and whether there's any real incentive on the Chinese side to include a broader range of people in the discussions about CBMs. Well, we certainly did talk to members of the DPP, and I should point out and do point out in the report uh, that the DPP, when it was in power, was a strong proponent of confidence-building measures uh, with the mainland. In fact, if you go back and look at defense white papers from Taiwan from 2002 and 2004, there's a far lengthier and more detailed section on military CBMs uh, than there is in the current one that has been uh, released under uh, Ma ying government uh, in 2009. Uh, there were specific proposals such as establishing uh, like a no-fly zone in the strait uh, uh, where uh, fighters on both sides would uh, remain a certain distance from uh, that, that, that center line, and, and the mainland did not respond uh, positively to that. Uh, but certainly um, the DPP has strongly advocated uh, CBMs and, and would want to be um, uh, consulted. Uh, it's just all of, I think, the Taiwan people would want to have an input uh, on issues relating to cross-strait uh, relations. Um, I think that from the Chinese perspective, there has long been recognition that excluding the opposition, um, not having an, any kind of dialogue with the opposition is, is really not in, in Beijing's interest. Um, I would say they have not done enough uh, to engage uh, DPP members, but they have certainly invited um, individuals not as representing their party in individual capacities, um, some of which, in fact, I recall last year there was an, uh, a conference on the mainland and two DPP <coughs> members went and were subsequently expelled from the party. Um, so I, it, it, the, the DPP ha obviously has to see the, that there is a value in talking to China as well. It's a two-way street. Gentleman, red shirt. Hi, Matt Fitzsimmons, DOD. Uh, my question is if China may desire to lock in any agreements made with Ma prior to 2012, because of its political weakness, 
But if a DPP resurgence occurs, wouldn't that invalidate any agreements that Ma may, may agree to and that were made without a, a domestic consensus in Taiwan? And does China realize that? I, I think clearly, potentially, uh, anything that is agreed upon could be reversed. Uh, but sometimes once governments agree on something and they begin to see some value in what they are doing, for example, if there were a hotline uh, established, uh, would it necessarily, perhaps it might fall into disuse, uh, but perhaps it, but it would still be functional, uh, just as CEF and ARATs continue, for example, to uh, exist, even though they were not um, performing the same kind of functions that they are performing under the, under the Ma government. The hope, of course, in the mainland side is that the things that they would establish um, would uh, survive a, a KMT regime. I think they're perfectly aware of, fact, of the fact that there, there are no guarantees. And some kinds of arrangements, I think, would be more likely to survive than others. There are some things that occurred during the DPP administration that also haven't been reversed. Uh, the um, uh, disbandonment, what was the word that was used of the, um, uh, the, <laughs> the, the unfreezing, the right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right, of the, um, uh, the, what was it, what was it called? National Unification. Thank you, National Unification Council, I appreciate that. Um, uh, obviously, it was very difficult. Um, Ma ying chose not to, re not to reverse that, even though that was something that he would like to have seen remain uh, in place. And so sometimes it's difficult for new governments to reverse what happened to done uh, by agreed upon by previous governments. of a DPP to power, um, especially now viewing the mass uh, popularity is uh, going down. Um, my question is, uh, in case uh, DPP return, does return to power in uh, 2012, which uh, some observ observers say, uh, uh, believe that it's not uh, something impossible, <coughs> what will happen? What, how about the uh, WHA? And how about uh, the uh, ECFA to be signed? And how about the other equipment already signed? Your question is, in the event that Ma ying has another four years, what will happen? Or no, what no, happens in if, case if, that if the DPP comes, yeah. comes to power? Uh, up to the, uh, the DPP, if it were to come back to power, to decide whether or not it would uh, continue to honor if there is a, a, a economic framework agreement, and I would say the same that I said to the previous questioner, uh, if there is some value in that economic cooperation agreement, I think it would be very difficult once you have uh, removed tariffs on specific items uh, to completely um, reverse that. You might not go further, uh, but uh, I, I, I think that there are people in the DPP today who are saying publicly that an ECFA is is right for uh, Taiwan. For example, um, I think Xu uh, Xinliang the other day said publicly that the DPP should not oppose uh, a cross-strait economic framework agreement. Um, there have been others, uh, like for example, former Vice President Annette Liu, who have said that there should not be a referendum uh, against the ECFA because that could be, it, it, the, the odds are that, that it would not pass. Uh, so I think there's a lot of different views uh, within the DPP, and it remains to be seen if they came back to power what their policy would be on this specific issue. Hi, uh, Colonel Huang from uh, Army War College. Uh, it's good uh, that I'm here as a scholar so I can speak uh, freely for the first time. Usually I'm, I, I don't. It was great uh, discussion and, and here, uh, but uh, I want to phrase in the Chinese phrase that 内行人看门道, 外行人看热闹. That means if you're insider, that you look into the niche point, 
but if you're an outsider, you only look for and watch for the cheerfulness. I would describe, as most of the people right now describe this relationship, has been improved you know, you know, unprecedentedly well in ever. But I would caution, uh, I would describe in the phrase, this is a beautiful wave that has many, many sharp quarries underneath the water. Let's look in the back of the history. It has gone back. This MCBM or CBM, you know, it's one way or two, you know, one way or the other. Let's, let's don't forget about MCBMs. Serve is not a final purpose. It's one of the tool. The final purpose is driven by the political trust. And I also, also think you all here implies there are so many uh, lack, so many will agree with me there, there's, basically lack of uh, political trust, and that's the real question. Let's go back to the history of constitution on both sides. There is a real problem here. You cannot get MCBM or CBN going unless there's one problem, which is, I think we're on, well, well on the track, which is 1992 consensus, that's one China. As far as you want to interpret which China, let's leave that in ambiguous because for the good of both sides, yes. So the question is, the question is, until the China and Taiwan recognize the sovereignty, which is recognized by both sides are the same, the sovereignty should be, and the territory should be shared by both sides, unless that is recognized in some kind of form, there is no room for MCBMs. There is no room for other things. Let's look at the real deep. That's, uh, so I was question, uh, my question will be, how do you create that room? As, as a facilitator that most of the people here, and I think in, in Richard Bush in five years ago, four or five years ago, mentioned in his book, Untie the Knots, he mentioned a lot of points in there. How do we be that facilitator here in the U.S. for, for creating that environment? I think we should. Well, I would agree with you that pol the absence of political trust is the problem. Uh, the two sides obviously do not agree fundamentally on the issue of sovereignty. But I would disagree that there must be an agreement to share sovereignty or have some solution on the settling the differences over sovereignty before CBMs can be agreed upon. The reason why we have had progress in the cross-strait relationship, one of the reasons, is because sovereignty has been shelved uh, for the time being. Both sides are crystal clear about their respective positions, and they recognize that it is not uh, in their interest to try and solve the sovereignty issue in the near term. So I think that it's important to use the opportunities that exist now to build a greater political trust, um, as you say, and to postpone uh, the discussion of uh, sovereignty uh, down the road. And I would add that although many people um, in this country and other places are concerned that relations between Taiwan and the mainland will get too close, um, I myself uh, think that we have seen a significant amount of progress in the two sides of the Straits relationship. We probably will see more, but the dangers of them hitting insurmountable obstacles and vectoring in opposite directions, having a reemergence of tensions, um, irrespective of whether the DPP comes back to power, by the way. Um, I think that that is um, uh, perhaps more likely than a real settlement of differences that results in ultimate unification. So I worry more personally about setbacks in this um, process than I do about real integration and unification between the two sides. And Richard, thank you for the plug on this book. Let's make sure we get on the I'm Mike Lozny from MIT and NDU. I have a question about a uh, stronger U.S.-Taiwan relationship and how it ties into CBMs. Uh, both in, in Bonnie's recommendations, and it sounds like Mike agrees, that this is almost a requirement to get to CBMs and to get the Taiwanese to, to be able to go along domestically is to have a stronger U.S.-Taiwan relationship. And you know, this goes back 20 plus years to the six assurances and the idea of needing Taiwan to feel strong enough so that when they interact with the mainland and negotiate with the mainland, they don't feel like they're going to be coerced. Um, and this kind of sounds like the, the new, a newer version of that argument. 
Um, when we then bring the way the PRC views this back into play, um, many of the, of the same things that you would want the U.S. to do to strengthen the U.S.-Taiwan relationship are the exact same things that the PRC would view as interfering in this and sending signals to separatist forces and, and all that. Um, is there any evolution on, on, on the mainland side of seeing, a real, seeing the, the link that we like to, to push between stronger U.S.-Taiwan relations as being a requirement to get to CBMs? I mean, Bonnie talked about a recognition that Mang Zhou's weak, uh, that there's a lack of domestic consensus. Uh, is, there any, is there any either change in the PRC or anything that the U.S. can do to help sell the PRC on that link itself of saying that we need to have stronger U.S.-Taiwan relations to get to CBMs? Does Mike want to say anything? <laughs> I think, I think the, sh the short answer, <laughs> you can correct me. I think the short answer first is that uh, there is little appreciation on the mainland side, except when you get maybe one person in a room and nobody else is listening. <laughs> um, there are individuals who will acknowledge that uh, if Taiwan feels insecure and vulnerable, that it is not <clears throat> likely to continue this policy of uh, moderation uh, towards the mainland and to move forward and to negotiate on some of these sensitive issues. So I, I would say the recognition exists um, in, in the minds of some individuals, whether it has percolated up to the top leaders, um, I don't know. But on the official level in Beijing, there is, um, there is no acceptance of the notion that a strong U.S.-Taiwan relationship is helpful. And I would argue that at this particular juncture in time especially, that a strong U.S.-Taiwan relationship um, is, is in uh, Beijing's interest, and that includes arms sales. Um, that uh, if Ma Yingjiu is seen as tilting toward China and as a result the, uh, the, the people vote him out of, of office, that will not make China happy. They would certainly like to keep him in power and keep the KMT in power. And if Ma feels um, uh, so insecure and so pressured by the mainland and vulnerable to uh, coercion by the mainland, then he will slow down. Um, or uh, n uh, not, can not move beyond the economic issues uh, that have been the focus of negotiations so far. Uh, so I would say uh, that a strong U.S.-Taiwan relationship at this particular juncture in time um, is helpful for Beijing, and I would encourage China to recognize that and, not, and, and, and limit its opposition to arms sales, which I understand why they are opposed, uh, but to limit it to um, rhetoric and um, uh, responses that do not have a, uh, an, a, a, a prolonged, uh, extensive um, uh, negative impact on the U.S.-China relationship. I only briefly add that um, you, you can get CBMs with a weak Taiwan. They're just not the CBMs you want. <laughs> so, um, and as the Colonel pointed out, the purpose is not to have CBMs, it's to reduce the risk of conflict, to build confidence, reduce the threat if you can. The other thing I would say is that, you know, the, the U.S. support for Taiwan in terms of uh, cabinet visits, arms sales, and so forth, goes beyond this question of cross trades dynamics and really gets to the heart of the question of what the rise of Chinese power means. If the rise of Chinese power means that we no longer, uh, that we change, uh, the, you know, policies on, on, on basic um, uh, uh, relationships uh, like the TRA with Taiwan, um, then that has implications for um, the credibility of our alliance with Japan, with Australia, with Korea, our relationship with India, across the whole Asia-Pacific region. So it's not just a matter of <laughs> helping uh, facilitate cross-straits um, uh, CBMs and confidence. It's also a question about a much more fundamental question that, that about, about the nature of how the U.S. and the region, uh, you know, integrates China in a positive way. We've already run out of time, but I'm going to take one last question. I appreciate it, Ralph. It's Peter Spiegel with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I want to go back to, to Chris's uh, opening question about, about arms sales. And frankly, you may have just answered the question, so it may be, be moot. But the, 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 the dynamic that you described in your opening comments about Beijing concerned that all these gains they've made with KMT since they came to government may be lost because of uh, diminished political support within Taiwan for, for the, the current government. <clears throat> that would seem to argue that the reaction towards the imminent arms sales would somehow be different that they, they are conscious that Ma is losing support, 
and therefore would m moderate their, their reaction to arms sales. It sounds like what you're saying is that in your discussions with the PRC side, there is no awareness, although there's awareness that, that the KMT is in danger politically, there's no awareness that the rhetoric on the, the arms sales is in any way affecting that. Can you address what you heard from the PRC in terms of the rhetoric and how it could affect KMT popularity domestically? For those in, in on the mainland who follow this, they do so very closely. They quote pol polling numbers. Uh, they note that Myingjo's support has been well below uh, 30 percent. Uh, we were there just in the aftermath of the typhoon, um, and uh, he was the government was being very, very harshly attacked. And that was cited as a cause for urgency to begin to address more sensitive uh, political and, and, and military issues. So there's certainly awareness. But I think on the mainland we have to remember that domestic politics trumps everything. And there is a perception in the mainland, um, and I don't have a way of proving this. Uh, perhaps they do polls internally that they don't share uh, with the outside, but there certainly is a claim that the leadership is under great pressure from the domestic population to protect uh, China's uh, sovereignty, territorial integrity, that Taiwan, along with Tibet and Xinjiang, are China's core uh, national interests. Uh, and, and so there, uh, with this perception that there is criticism from the domestic population, there is a, uh, a sense in the leadership that they have to be tough. Um, and if you combine this with what I said earlier, their assessment that their uh, position in the world has grown and the United States is, is valuing the uh, U.S.-China relationship more and that we're on, we're on more equal footing because they own so much of our Treasury bonds, uh, that this then provides, they believe, greater leverage over the United States on this issue. And this is where I would point back to what I said earlier that I do think is a miscalculation, that ultimately the United States has its interest as well. And it's not just interests in uh, U.S. relations with Taiwan, as important as those are, but it's also our credibility um, throughout the entire region and more globally and the commitments that we make to our allies. And I would, I would say that when in 19... 96, when the Clinton administration dispatched two aircraft carriers to the region, it was not just to respond to uh, the uh, threat that China's missiles um, faced as they were being fired toward, uh, toward the island, uh, but also the way the administration thought about uh, how it would be perceived by other countries uh, in the region and our broader reputation in the region. Um, I think I just at a brief code, I think uh, that's exactly right. And this is what um, President Obama might call a teachable moment. Um, uh, in some ways, it's all the more important now. And I think my sense is this is where the White House is, judging from their, their actions this month. It's all the more important now to demonstrate that the financial crisis has not changed the fundamentals, that the President will see the Dalai Lama, that arms sales will move forward. And even if that uh, causes a rough patch in U.S.-China relations, my sense is the administration is prepared and, and strategically and politically sees it as necessary to go down to go down that road. And Secretary Clinton, in her comments to the Post, tried to put some context around it and emphasize the positive. But but I didn't detect anything in what she said uh, that would suggest that, that that there won't be a pretty firm moving forward on some of these issues, even if Beijing doesn't like it over the next few months. Yeah, I would. I would say in, in some respects, as we all know, the Chinese have painted themselves in a corner. If we say we're going to sell bow and arrow uh, to Taiwan, they have the same, you know, uh, harsh, harsh reaction and it's the end of the world. So, uh, but, but when you talk to Chinese uh, privately, my sense is that they do make a distinction uh, between the 2001 package and the F-16 Cs and Ds. Uh, that, that is the real difference in, in China, and uh, they can probably uh, huff and puff and not do much more uh, on the 2001 package, but it would be very hard-pressed to ignore uh, F-16 Cs and Ds. So I, I think there is sort of a, a distinguishing point there. I think Bonnie's point is, is also uh, very true. Uh, I have run a number of different U.S.-China conferences, and, and at one of them, at my closing remark to our Chinese colleagues was, Beware of premature arrogance. 
the Chinese, I think, have become extremely overconfident uh, and uh, will probably uh, do a little bit of miscalculating. Uh, and it's only natural that they're going to test uh, to see just how, how far they can push. Uh, and I think they'll get the pushback, and, and that will be a useful, a useful lesson as, as we go forward. Uh, please join me in thanking both Bonnie and Mike and our questions.